The Bible says that God inhabits. I love that. He inhabits the praises of his people. You know, whenever you may feel, and, and, I know, and I'm, I'm speaking this, listen. Whenever you feel as if, man, it just seems like the Lord is a million miles away from me or from my personal situation. Now, you know deep down inside that's not true. Amen. Because the promise of God from Jesus is, you know what? He will never leave you or forsake you, Amen. even to the end of the world. But because we are tripartite in our corporality, having, rather, being spirit, possessing soul, and housed in a body, from time to time we may be challenged and tested at either one of those levels. After all, it's enough for us to be as our master, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I recall, in the account of the, the uh, the Mount of Temptation, where Jesus went up and was tempted, the devil tested him at all three levels. Started with the flesh, moved to the soul, advanced up to the spirit, if I could put it that way. And in every instance, Jesus said there's one solution. It is written. Amen. When the test comes to your flesh, it is written. When the test comes to your mind, your will, and your emotions, which makes up your soul, it is written. And I'm deliberately pointing like this because I want to kind of give the, you know, the illustration of a sword. Because the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And I want to tell you, the devil will try to test you even at the level of the Spirit. And if he does, once again, it is written again. And there's the key to, you know, plowing through difficult challenges and times. And I know, I'm like you. I'm flesh and blood, but I'm spirit, soul, and body, just like you. And the same temptations. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. Now, that, that's, that's a hurdle you and I are not likely to jump, but thank God that Jesus jumped it and succeeded. And he passed the victory to us. And thus we are benefited thereby. And we should never lose sight of that either. And it's not, a, it shouldn't be an urgent desire within us to transgress against the word or to sin. But if we do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have his advocacy ministry, rec I should say, identified through 1 John 1 and 9, which says that if we confess our sin... He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank God for the word of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness, mercy, grace, and compassion. Above all, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his precious redeeming blood. Thank you for your holy written word and for the mighty Holy Spirit. It is with great joy, unspeakable, and full of glory that we deposit this service into your charge for safekeeping. We thank you in advance for anointing our ears, minds, hearts, and souls to receive the engrafted word of God. And for all that shall be said, wrought, revealed, and manifested, we covenant to give you and you alone all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Thank you for anointing this vessel of clay to minister life to your people, boldly, without fear, favor, or respect of persons, declaring the unsearchable riches of Christ, that your word may proceed as it does from your own mouth. It will not return to you void, but it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereunto it is sent. We believe we receive these petitions which we have desired of you, for we ask them in that mighty, matchless, and majestic name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, and all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Now, the last Sunday, I was ministering concerning distinguishing the Holy Spirit. In other words, you've got to be able to discern the difference between what is of God and what is not of God. And I want to tell you that as we move down the prophetic timeline, you've heard me mention that phrase a number of times. God, this is the way I describe it. Now, you know, you read the Bible. If you read the Old Testament, you see the Old Testament prophets speaking of things yet to come. You see Jesus and his ministry as recorded by 
the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus makes a number of references back to the Old Testament and specifically the Old Testament prophets themselves concerning things that they said and talking about things to come. When you move further into the New Testament, which frankly begins at the book of Acts, or what they what the publishers call the Acts of the Apostle, when in fact really it's the Acts of the Holy Ghost through the Apostles and anybody else through who he will work. Amen? And that includes all of us. But then, you know, Paul really gets down deep into many of the things, uh, not of the New Testament, but also of the season in, in the New Testament in which we live. But then you get to the book of the Revelation. And by the way, it's not revelations as in plural with an S. That could be, you say, because there is only one. It is the book of the Revelation. Why is it singular and why is it one and why am I making a big deal out of it? Well, I'm not really making a big deal out of it. I'm just calling it as, as it is. It is the book of the Revelation. It is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that is, shall I say, dispensing the revelation. John is like the stenographer. Now, I know stenography really has to do with taking notes in shorthand. You, you take complex, copious information from people and you try to make it short. You know how it is in texting. Have you ever read a text from one of your young people? You might as well just confess. Now, I, don't, I can't make any sense of it. I'm sure you can. <laughs> because they shorten everything. They, they have letters. IDK means I don't know. Amen. OMG, oh my goodness. Okay, everybody, you know, they, they have all this little shortcut or shorthand Amen. to express themselves. All right. Well, now, John is not exactly short noting the book of the Revelation. But he's laying it out, and he lays it out in the language of a first century man. John, in that book, now that's not my topic. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm going with the Holy Ghost right now, folks. So just, just go on with me here. Y'all on board? The wind of the Spirit is blowing, so let, let's move where he wants to go. But in the Revelation, uh, John pens down some extraordinary things, uh, things maybe much unlike much of the rest of the Bible. But nevertheless, he sees these things. Jesus opens the eyes of his understanding to see it. You see, John himself, in listen, in the book of the Revelation, John is literally operating in manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Several of them. John is definitely operating in the word of wisdom. Why? Because Jesus is revealing the will of God that is to come. The word of wisdom is a manifestation of the spirit of God that when it is upon an individual, it reveals the will and purpose of God and deals with things of a future nature. A lot of people say, well, so-and-so prophesied to me that this would happen. I understand what they mean. And a lot of times we toss around ecclesiastical terms with sort of a casual attitude. But see, when we're dealing with instruction, as we're dealing with here today, I have to get kind of accurate with you to help you really appreciate the way the word is structured and, and how it works with us and through us and for us. So not only is John dealing with the word of wisdom, John also deals with the word of knowledge. He is receiving fragmentary information from the Spirit of God that deals with things here and now and things, if you would please, of the past. And all that's in the book of Revelation. John is also operating in the discerning of spirits because he is beholding the resurrected Christ. He himself said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And then he goes on to describe the revelation of Jesus, and Jesus opens the, his eyes, if you would, spiritually speaking, to see all these things. These things that he's seen is like a great vision to see these things that are coming upon the earth. And you know, apparently he was in the spirit for quite some time. Because when you consider the length of the book and all the things that he recorded there, I mean, he wasn't out for five minutes. Now, it may have been five minutes. Say, so why would you say something like that? 
I don't know, same reason why Peter said a year is as a thousand days to the Lord and a thousand days is, amen, or a thousand years is one day, right? Or one day is as a thousand years, whatever. All right. Well, you know, in other words, God can compress time. It is said clinically that when human beings dream, the dreams typically come just shortly before you wake up. And the, the, uh, the duration of a dream may be no more than a minute or 30 seconds, and yet you feel like, man, you've been here and there and everywhere. <laughs> so, some of you spend what seems like days, maybe months, in your dream. And yet you know you weren't laying in the bed for days and months, right? You wake up with right? Well, see, as I said, now this is just sort of technical, but I just want you to understand because sometimes visions and dreams can truly reveal things in a period of time, and God is aware of that. Look at the things that God revealed to Daniel. It's awesome. When he had to discern the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had, Nebuchadnezzar was demanding that someone tell him what it was he dreamed because he forgot it. And then not only did he want to know what he dreamed, he wanted to know what it meant. So, I mean, he was coming real heavy. Hey, you, you, you guys tell me what this is and tell me what it means. None of the king's wise men, those sorcerers, the Chaldeans, and all those people could do either. Only Daniel could. And it wasn't Daniel who in his own strength and way could do it. It was the Spirit of God that opened that up. Now back to the Revelation for a second. So John goes through this thing, and as I said, just looking at it, you say, well, wait a minute, it would take me days to write this thing out. And for all per practical purposes, all intents and purposes, it may have probably taken John days to write it out. And supernaturally, he had to remember it, what God gave him. And that's a lot of information there. But as I said, he penned it down in first century language because John had never seen the modern ordinances that we have today, meaning, you know, aircraft and munitions and bombs, smart bombs, cruise missiles, nuclear weapons, uh, the likes, and, and what the average soldier is equipped with on this day. <laughs> John was used to Romans. John was used to the Roman legions that marched through by the thousands, taking over cities and towns to include them in the Roman Empire. These guys had those short little swords and those shields that they would carry. They had that little, what I call a little hairbrush type of, you know, helmet on and, and all that kind of thing. A amen. They had a girdle, as it were, around, the, you know, to hold everything together. And they had sandals. Now, they weren't walking around in combat boots. They didn't have those. And that's what John was accustomed to. And so the language he used, he had to use out of the lexicon or his own vocabulary in the first century. This is why a lot of people shun the book of the Revelation because they say, well, I can't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. And how are these boulders coming out of the sky? Well, if you've never seen a bomb fall, you'd probably call it a boulder too. I don't know what you'd call it. Amen? <laughs> or you say, well, it's raining objects, and I don't know what these objects are. But John saw these things. Like I said, he's never seen an Apache helicopter. And if you look straight on at one, or whatever the latest thing is, these Black Hawk helicopters, whatever the latest thing is they have, and these attack helicopters, you look at them straight on, they about look like a, a, a mechanical locust. You look through the windshield, man, it's like, oh my goodness, it looks like it's got eyeballs and stuff. And then when it does, it shoots fire out. You ever heard of a hellfire missile? Yeah, that's something in the arsenal of the United States military. Man, once they fire that fella, that's why they call it hellfire. There's a real reason for that name. Because when it hits, it's all that and more, okay? It blows up, it sets a fire, it blaze, and all this kind of thing. And yes, those are the musicians that they use. We have drones flying around out there, and they look like little insects. I'm just, I'm just saying to the uninitiated, if you've never seen one, you say, what is that? Imagine you just come from the first century. And you come through the time tunnel, you know, Pastor likes that a little bit, the time machine. And you land here in the 21st century. And, and we, we let you take a tour of one of our bases, one of our military bases. You look at this stuff and say, oh my goodness, look at that gigantic bird. It's not a bird, man, it's an airplane. It's a big transport jet. And the little ones are fighters. 
but you've never seen that before. So if you ask the guy, well, describe what you see. He's going to talk to you in terms he can understand. So don't be afraid to read it. The Bible promises a blessing to the people that read the words of that prophecy. Now, once again, I, had, I got started on this, and it, it moved a little bit further along. And I'm going, like I said, I'm going with the Holy Ghost. So anyway, getting back to John and his receipt of the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, he's operating in all these manifestations of the Spirit, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, the discerning of spirits, and, of course, prophecy. There's, there's dialogue going on in the midst of this. Remember that John saw something, and he, was, he became upset. So it's amazing to me that John's faculties were involved in this process of receiving the revelation. So they were looking for somebody who could open the seal, but there was none who could open it, not, not one. And John's got a vision into heaven, but they said the lamb was found worthy to loose the seal and so forth, amen? In the book of life and, and, and on and on that John went. And, and John became emotional. I mean, in other words, he's disturbed. Well, my goodness, who in the world is going to bring this to pass? So he's a witness to that. John saw some amazing things. And obviously, let me put it this way, because the word has now developed such negative connotation in our days. But Jesus groomed him for this event. And I see, you, you, you can groom in a positive way, and you can groom in a negative way. You can groom in an edifying and upbuilding way, or you can groom in a degradating way, okay? Amen. But Jesus, as you know, you had the 12 disciples. You had the three that usually were with Jesus through the course of his earthly ministry, which included Peter, James, and John. Now, John had the common denominator of being a part of all three of these special groups of people. He was one of the 12. He certainly was one of the three. But then he was the one. The one who, during the Last Supper, was laying upon Jesus' chest <clears throat> and always wanted to be around Jesus. See, he, he was always like the closest to him. And this was nothing kinky, nothing funny, nothing, you know, perverted. And uh, let me put it this way. The scripture says, I pause here and enter a parenthetical footnote. Bible says that it is he, speaking of God, that has made us and not we ourselves. We didn't make ourselves. I don't care how good you think you are. <laughs> I don't care how skilled you've discovered yourself to be. If you've discovered gifts, we'll praise the Lord for every one of them because he is the giver of them. He's the, the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. So if you found and discovered skills and gifts and abilities, they're courtesy of God. Amen. And they're on loan to you. Amen. You didn't buy them. They were purchased with the blood of Jesus. You say, well, what about the unsaved people? Same thing. Every human is made in the image and after the likeness of God. God did not say that the people that do not embrace Christ as Savior are not. And I, I have way, I have a lot of proof of that. A lot of proof. You've got nations out here, all over the world, nations, that have governments, that have militaries, that have businesses, that have a political system, that have all kinds of things. They have agriculture. They have almost all the things that we take for granted right here in the United States of America. They may have some things we don't. We probably have some things that they don't. And yet it, we know also, uh, spiritually speaking and even culturally speaking, some of these nations do not accept or recognize Jesus as the Savior or as the Messiah. Amen. Amen. But one thing the Bible says, everybody will give an account. Amen. Everybody will give an account. 
I know people say, well, where was God back during these ancient empires and things like that? He, he, where he always has been. And God was always sending a message about him. Word, listen, word spread real quick. Now, I realize I'm sort of moving around a little bit, but listen, go back for a minute. Remember Jericho and the children of Israel were heading toward that? Do you understand that word had gotten out in Jericho about Israel? That the children of Israel had a God. In other words, there were people living back in the times, listen, when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt from slavery. And they went into other lands. And let me tell you something. So those lands were occupied by people. But word could get around. Now, they didn't have text. They didn't have social media. But word got out there. That some great, listen, a great God brought out an entire nation of people from the midst of the great ancient Egyptian empire. Folks knew there was a pharaoh. They knew that they, they were building great uh, monuments and all this kind of thing, the pyramids, all the things that they erected. Those uh, Egyptian kings called pharaohs were always making all kinds of things to and for themselves. And word of that got around. Don't think there was an international and world travel back then simply because you didn't have Delta Airlines or Carnival Cruise Lines or, or Greyhound buses. Don't, don't think for a minute those people used Beasts of Burden, man, and they traveled a lot of distance. I tell you what, it's amazing to me just to travel. I, we've been to Israel a few times, and it's amazing to travel through there. Uh, at, I mean, when you go over there, of course, now you ride on a coach, a bus to get from, you know, one tour destination to another. Uh, take you from Jerusalem down to the Dead Sea and other sites, Capernaum and all these different cities. You see, you can see Jericho, Bethlehem and whatnot. And, and, I'm, and I'm just thinking to myself as I'm going from place to place, oh, my goodness, Jesus and his disciples were on foot. Now, for the most part, you know, he stayed in the region of Judea with his ministry. And, and Israel's a little larger than you think. It is about the size of our state of New Jersey. Right, right now, it's in a state of bad conflict at the time I'm bringing this message. And, and I'll talk about that another time. I, I don't want to get into that at this specific moment. But nevertheless, I just want to give you a feel for what's going on. God can get what he needs to get done no matter who, no matter where, no matter how. And that's something that you ought to pack with you every day that you live. I love my, one of my favorite questions in Scripture. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer is obvious. No. Nothing's too hard for him. So the hardest thing you can bring to him, the toughest situation you may be dealing with in your life, is, is child's play, if I may to God to unravel and to deal with. Even when you've wound and bound yourself up, and a lot of people do, some don't survive it, but some live to praise God another day because they trust in him. David said, I once was young, and at the time he was making this declaration, he said, but now I'm old. And I don't know how old he was when he said that. But he said, I have never. Now, he's speaking for his own lifetime, which he had a good long life. And he reigned a good long time over Israel. He said, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He's talking about righteousness then. He said, the righteous have not been forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. So what was his metric for determining who was righteous? Apparently during that time, nothing more than that people worshiped the true and the most high God. Because see, in those days, and still in these days now, because spirits never die. You still have polytheistic people today. You know what I mean by that? People that worship many gods. We only know the one, the true, and the living God. And if you want to know the true, he is the one and the only and the true and the living God. The creator of heaven and earth. But there are some people who have a spiritual belief system that depend on many gods. They got a God for this and a God for that and a God for the other. 
and, and all of them demand worship in one way or another in order to appease them and to appropriate whatever it is you believe they can deliver to you. And then there are people outright that worship maybe one false god. But it's not the great God, Jehovah. The, you see, that name means the eternally existent one. Because see, some of these, whatever, whoever, folks are worshiping man, have lost, they're in a tomb. They're dead, and they've been dead. And their bones are still there, I guess, unless they've dissolved into powder. But I'm just telling you, you you'll find them there. The, the, the pharaohs thought they were God. The Caesars thought they were God. Many emperors thought they were God. But they're dead. We found their tomb. Or there was a sarc... The word slips me right now, but it's a word that describes an Egyptian mummy. Casket. It's a fancy word. But anyway, I don't, thank you. Yeah, who was, what was it? Sarcophagus. I thought that was it. Thank you. I got some educators in here. Praise the name of Jesus. Yeah. In other words, God has left so many clues to you and me for us to know that He and He alone is God Almighty. He can always be trusted. He can always be counted on. He's always faithful. And above, if I could say this, above all of that, He loves us with an unconditional love. Amen. The devil has no clue what it's like to be you, but Jesus does because he was one of us. Amen. The Bible said that he dwelt among us and he was tempted in all points like as we are. He suffered things that you and I commonly suffer through. Don't be afraid of that word. Because suffering is a reality in this world. It has no place in the world to come. No place. But here, it is a reality. Now, that said, that's why you want to walk with the Lord. You want to stay full of his word. You want to speak his word. It seemed like I remember Jesus would ask this question. <laughs> You say to people that question him, how long shall I suffer thee? Well, actually, the word suffer means to permit or to allow. You know, in other words, how long am I going to have to put up with you guys? Ye of little faith or you who have no faith. And they're walking with Jesus, man, for three years. Oh, my goodness, what a class. Now, a lot of us couldn't survive the classroom, man, because it moved from place to place, you know. Like I said, you go to Israel and see some of these hills and these valleys and these places where they had to go to get from one place to another. You say, hey, wait a minute, I I'm withdrawing. <laughs> I, I can't take this. And then Jesus would take him into a cave someplace or he'd go in a cave somewhere, man, and just, you know, pray all night long. Wait a minute, what, what kind of class is this, Lord? <laughs> but what's very, very important, as I said to you, is distinguishing the Holy Spirit. He leads us. He guides us, and he also warns us of what is to come. He's a part of our lives. It should be absolutely an essential part of our lifestyles. The Holy Spirit ministers us with guidance, leading us daily. He provides us with revelation, sharing with us what is to come. Things spoken in heaven and manifested on the earth, just like he did to John uh, the revelator we call him, but he is actually one of the apostles of the Lamb and uh, indeed a disciple of Jesus. Listen, my brothers and sisters, there is no daily report from the world that does not include evil perpetrated, violence, crimes committed, and deception, fraud, and lying. Not one day goes by that there's no report of those things. Amen. That in and of itself is a testament to the condition of the heart of humanity. I realize there's nice people, good people, good-natured people, good-spirited people, but there's some bad folks out there too. Some evil people, some wicked people. 
that are not beneath doing evil and wicked and bad things. And even so much so that even you as a believer would say, surely God could not forgive this person. Surely God could not redeem this person. Well, see, if, if you make a declaration like that, you are a fool. Because you have, you have just said that the blood of Jesus is ineffective. Now, in the case of that individual, it may not have yet been applied. Absence the application of the blood, which I will say meaning salvation, meaning the confession of Jesus as Lord and the belief that God has raised him from the dead. Absent that, that individual is lost and unregenerated. But don't say that the blood is ineffective and cannot save from the guttermost to the uttermost because it can't. Some of you possibly in your lives have dealt with people you thought they're never getting saved. They're never coming to Jesus. They don't believe in God. They don't want anything to do with God. Some of you deal with individuals like that. You say, well, man, there's no hope for them. And you throw up your hands. Holler and give up. Yeah, like Marvin Gaye said in the song. Right? Okay. <laughs> they make you want to holler, throw up both your hands. And, and you know, and, and sometimes you get so frustrated, you want to say, Lord, I'll turn them over to you. No, you ready to say, I'll turn him over to the devil. <laughs> Just let him take him out. No, don't do that. Sometimes, man, there are people, there are people you, have, you need to reach, and you may have to pray for them for years. One well, of my dear friends, the late Norval Hayes, told me about a businessman, because Norval was a businessman. And there's this guy he wanted to get saved, and of course he witnessed to him, and the guy rejected it. And Norval told me he prayed for the man for 10 years. Just kept praying for him. Confessing over him. Asking God, send a laborer across his path. Send one that'll drop seed and somebody else out of water. And Lord bless it would increase. You say, well, what happened? What do you think happened? He got saved. It took 10 years, but he got saved. It's a testament to what Luke wrote in the 18th chapter, opening up that verse before he talked about the parable of the unjust judge. He said that Jesus spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. In spite of how tumultuous, chaotic the world becomes, you, ought, you and I ought always to pray and not to faint, give up, and throw in the towel. Because see, at, listen to me, at the word of God, <laughs> has eternal efficacy. It's eternally effective. Not just because somebody doesn't accept it. Or, or because you call yourself applying it, whatever the case may be, however you do it, whether you do it through confession, whether you do it through the laying on of hands, and you don't get the result you desire, does not make the word of God of no effect. Do not look to God for the problem or for the issue. And don't struggle. Man, here I go back to Brother Norval again because I, I remember his stories and whatnot. But I got some stories to tell you. But I remember his daughter, his only child, had a bunch of warts on her body. And he was praying and asking God to get rid of the warts on her body, and she just kept them. They didn't go anywhere. It was a sudden manifestation, like a miracle, that all the warts began to disappear from her body. In fact, it scared her. She said to her father, Daddy, Daddy, look, these warts are gone. What, what, what happened? I, I'm scared, Daddy. What's up? You... Well, see, he wouldn't give up on prayer. And a manifestation came in. If he'd given up on that businessman, 
if he'd given up on his daughter because she was a wild thing. She ran with gangs. Norval told me all about it. Yeah, I, you know, whatever your kids and grandkids were doing, his, his daughter was doing. And I'm not saying that yours are. I'm just saying if you got them. I know, I know it's the neighbor down the street, but I'm just saying. If you have one or two of them in your clutch, okay, you don't have to give up and throw in the towel and say, well, you know, Pastor, I've been praying over this child. I've been, I've been praying over this man. I've been praying over this woman. It just looks like they won't change and this and that. Now, well, I got news for you. You can't change them. And that might be, uh-oh, that might be the issue. That might be the obstruction. That might be the injunction. Because deep down on the inside, you convinced yourself you're going to change them. No. You're not going to do that. You can be married for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. You ain't changing nobody. Only God can change a person. Look how he changed you. That's right. Yeah, amen. Now, now I'll tell you, the principle is this. When another living person comes into your life, your life changes. It's not because they changed it. It's because when they came in, they brought an environment. They brought a, you know, it gets a little deep. But, but folks don't realize, man, uh, we're, we're almost like little bodies. It's almost like the planets in the universe and things like that. You know, you have to be careful whose gravitational pull you get into. You have to be careful the influences you get around or you allow around you. You know what you bring to the table, but you don't exactly know what somebody else. Now, I'm not telling you to be suspect. This is not a message to tell you to be wary, afraid, and suspicious of everybody. But you know what? You won't have to be if you catch this message distinguishing the Holy Spirit. Okay? If you learn how to be led by the Spirit of God, He can help take the guesswork out of all of that, those experiences for you. And I'm going to tell you something. Uh, what, what is going on? People are now asking the question, the world's asking the question, what is happening around here? What's going on? Why are these kids doing crazy stuff? Why don't they have any sense? Why? Now, I know I'm, I'm speaking in a general catch-all type of a phrase, but that's, these are the terms that people are using. What's wrong with these young people? What is their problem? What is their major malfunction here? And, we're look, and you know what we do? We wind and bind ourselves up in all kind of sophisticated jargon and, and nonsense ourselves Amen. when the Bible has the answer for everything. Amen. The short answer is Jesus is the answer. Amen. When I say that, there's a lot of people that think, oh man, you're just throwing this catch-all out there. No, I'm, I'm throwing the solution out there. I'm throwing the cure for whatever it is out there because Jesus is it. Why? Because he is the word of God and the answer to all of earth's ills. All of humanity's ills is the word of God. Amen. Getting the word off the pages and into your heart. And ultimately as an expression or confession of faith. Father, I thank you that I'm the head and not the tail. That I'm above only and not beneath. I thank you that I'm blessed when I come in and blessed when I go out. I'm blessed in my basket and blessed in my store. God, I'm not going to throw in the towel on my children because according to your word, when I obey your word, listen, the fruit of my womb is blessed. My seed is blessed. Everything that I put my hand to is blessed. Because I listen, listeningly. That's what Deuteronomy 28 says. It says, you hearken diligently. It's a double thing. It's a, listen, listening is the best way to describe it in English. Because I, I'll use this. You listen diligently Amen. to the word of God. And, and listen, you got to take it a step further. You diligently apply it. Amen. You know what I love about the word? You don't have to go to Home Depot Amen. and get it, get it like a can of paint. 
you got to buy a little stir stick, and then you dip your brush in there, and you go through all these chains, put it in the pan, get your roller in there. That, this is not the kind of application we're talking about. Uh, the psalmist said, make my tongue as the pen of a ready writer. There's the instrument with which you apply the word. Now, I just use the illustration of a paint can, paint, and a brush, and a roller. That's how you apply paint. But when you want to apply the word, let your tongue be as the pen of a ready writer and get the stroking. You know, get the writing with your tongue. How, speaking the word. Jesus said, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that thing which he said he shall have whatsoever he say. That's how you apply the word, by speaking it. You, 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 listen, don't fool yourself. You, you, you may speak, just like I just uh, made a confession of faith out of Deuteronomy 28, you can make a confession of faith out of anything in there where God's promises are concerned. And of course, one of, all, one of all of our favorite ones is the one, you know, Isaiah 54 and 17. No weapon. Personalize the thing. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against me in judgment, I shall condemn. For this is my heritage as a servant of the Lord. Now, when it says you'll condemn it, it doesn't mean you're going to beat somebody upside the head. No, it means by application of the word, you'll bring whatever that negative confession is down. You're, you're casting down strongholds. And that's why you need the help of salvation, because you need to protect your mind from an assault of the fiery darts of the wicked one. That's what the shield of faith quenches, the fiery darts of the wicked one. See, they used to fire flaming arrows from on top of the walls of cities like Jericho to fight off enemies, to destroy enemies. But you see, all the Roman people would do, all the folks that had any good sense out there in warfare, they raised their shields. And those flaming arrows are ineffective against the shield. They just boop and bounce off and flame out. And that's what you have to do. I, I'm saying from a spiritual perspective. Remember the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They do not pertain to the flesh. But they are mighty. They're energized. They're made powerful and potent through God. Literally through the power of the Holy Spirit Amen. to the pulling down of strongholds. Amen. And all of that is literally at your command. Amen. Command of your tongue. Well, my husband won't do right. Well, my wife won't do right. Well, my kids won't do right. Then you know what you do? You speak a word over them. You know what you're doing, don't you? You're calling those things that be not as though they were. So where there's stubbornness, you speak gentleness. You speak, mm, what's that word I'm looking for? Yeah, you, you, you speak tenderness. You speak openness. You just have to call those things which be not as though they were. You're calling for things. Now, let me put it this way. You're not the mechanic exactly who's going to put these things in a person. But what you're doing is you're giving the Spirit of God a license to get working on that. And he has the ways and the means that are beyond us. You know what? You, listen. Oh my God, thank you, Jesus. Why? Because his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. See, our ways and thoughts are not his. So what you're doing is you're appealing to him. You are, and through, listen, you're appropriating faith through God to deal with people. See, God does not usurp the will of another person. But God is the maker of us all. He knows what it takes to deal with any of us at any time. 
Now, I want to get away from the negative for a second. Think about people you know that were a bad dream, <laughs> your worst nightmare. And all of a sudden you find, oh my goodness, their life has turned completely around. What happened? They had an encounter with God. They came to a place where they could make a decision to accept God's word, to accept the Savior, to accept the truth, to believe on it, put their faith and their trust in it. And as a result, it made a difference in their life. Scripture says that the way of the transgressor is hard. You know why? Because that's true. It doesn't mean that righteous people don't face tough times. Because the Bible also says many are the afflictions of the righteous. But I noticed the verse that said that, you know, the way of the transgression is hard doesn't give you anything. But, but, but it says that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him from out of them all. Now, that, that's, that's available, and that's accessible to anyone who chooses it. And that's what we all need to be encouraged with. It's all, we need to walk away with something today, with that inspiration, with that determination, and the discipline to apply that word that we need to apply to deal with our everyday lives. Right quick. How can you recognize the Holy Spirit and distinguish him from other spirits? Well, number one, I'm going to give you this and I'm going to wrap. He has the distinct attribute of holiness. That, that, the character of the Holy Spirit is just that. That's why he's called the Holy Spirit. He's not the profane spirit. He's not cussing, Amen. using vulgarity and, and all that kind of thing. Amen. All right. He is the spirit of holiness, truth, yeah. grace, in power. Thirdly, nothing unholy proceeds from him. Nothing unholy proceeds from him. There's a lot of stuff out here, a lot of spirits out here, and they're not holy at all. He cannot be manipulated. No one can gain mastery over him. The Bible says in Thessalonians, Chapter 5, verse 19, quench not the spirit. Literally, his spirit, the spirit not quench, connotes the extinguishing of a flame or a fire. Because that's what he is. He's like your pilot light, but he's better than that. He's a flame of fire on the inside of him. But don't quench him. Don't put him out. Amen. Amen. And this is in regards to the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in any of his expressions, gestures, and acts. The gifts of God, according to Romans 11, 29, are irrevocable, meaning they cannot, they're without repentance. God doesn't come and do a recall on you. I saw recently in the news that one of those motor companies out there recalled, I don't know, a hundred some thousand vehicles because of an airbag problem or something, some, some problem. That means they got to recall them. Bring them back in here, man. They're messed up. We got to fix them. God is not recalling you. The, the thing about it is, man, God, listen. God's got a repair shop open 24-7. Amen. And, and he can meet you wherever you are. Now, one thing is, yeah, he does have some dealerships in which you can get some service, and that's called a church, like this one. Amen. Amen. Yeah, see, once these men, listen, once these gifts are bestowed, they're never rescinded or recalled. Recipients can use, misuse, or even neglect such gifts. But the gifts are not a conditional loan. Amen. They are irrevocable. Finally, the Holy Spirit functions as a servant of God, the Father, and God, the Son. Now, they are equal, co-equal, if you would please, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it's the Holy Spirit that carries out, if I may, the wishes of the Father and the Son. Jesus being the head of the church, the Father, of course, being the creator of all things. This reinforces the honorable nature of service, something sometimes resented and rejected by some people who fail to understand the importance of service. What can you do? 
what are you doing? Then just do it. Amen. Amen. The aim of the Holy Spirit is to point to Jesus and glorify him. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. He does not glorify a human personality. He does not glorify a doctrine. He does not glorify a movement. And he does not glorify a denomination or an institution. He glorifies God and more specifically glorifies Jesus. Amen. It's his desire as it were, to make Jesus known to all of humanity because he knows that is the only hope for all of humanity. Amen. Now, there are some practical things you need to take away with you. That's being sure to apply the word of God to yourself. Yes, make yourself some confessions of faith. Where you find yourself falling short, call for what it is you need. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody fails at something or not. All this kind of thing. I don't just say that out there just to make you feel good. I say that out there, man, to make you think. To make you do some self-examination. And seek the face of God. Get wisdom from God on how you deal with that. Amen. Now, really, uh, amen. And, and Praise the Lord. That concludes our lesson for the day. But whoever you are, wherever you are, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you right now to go with us as we go boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And I want you to pray this prayer from your heart to the heart of God because you've got his attention wherever you are, whoever you are. And let's pray together and say, Dear God, Dear God in heaven, I come to you realizing that in my life I have sinned and come short of your glory. I repent of all of my sin and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who died on the cross and shed his blood to save me from all of my sin is the Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead, that I might be justified, just as if I had never sinned. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and live in me now. I believe that I receive eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, that I am now made a new creation in Christ Jesus, born again of the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer with us, congratulations to you. We're excited. Welcome into the family of God because that absolutely has brought you into the family of God. Not only that, you're now officially a citizen of the kingdom of heaven with all the rights, privileges, practices, and principles thereunto. We even have a constitution. It's called the Bible. Amen. So I want to encourage you, if you don't have one, get one. Still the number one selling book in the world. Amen. It never goes out of style. It's never antiquated. It's always current. Oh, think about that. Always current. You know, the reason you get rid of some of those books you read and think, I'm tired of that. That's old stuff. No, the Bible never gets old, my friend, because it's universally applicable to every circumstance and situation of life. There's a lot of people that think we're too modern for that. We're too advanced for that. Uh, we're living in another generation. We're living in another era now, and that's old hat. No, it's not old hat. You'll be amazed because I, I tell you what, the experiences you're going to have as a person are the same. The wisest man in the world, as designated by you, said there's nothing new under the sun. So what's he saying? He's already told you, you are mistaken. If you think there's something new that God can't catch up with or doesn't know about, he's got everybody's number. And he has a solution to every issue that humanity faces. So don't fool yourself into thinking that God is irrelevant or immaterial or insignificant. No, he's the one that can help you through anything that you're dealing with. Yeah, there's some acute issues that humanity is going through in these times right now, but the great physician, 
is able. Well, I'll put it this way. He's already applied the cure. And all you need to do is receive it. He's dispensing it. You need to receive it in Jesus' name.